Today, I'm gonna to walk you through the AAMC sample test psych Soch passage number eight. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. Like always, I'm gonna read the passage, flow chart it out, and show you how to get all the answers correct. So, jumping right in, this passage says, in study one, a study on stereotype threat. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and highlight that. Remember from your flashcards what stereotype threat is. It's this idea that if you're in a situation where you feel like you are going to negatively perform, you're gonna feel some anxiety associated with it. And a lot of times that anxiety is gonna make you more likely to perform poorly. So this study on stereotype threats says a group of men and women were randomly assigned to take a standardized math exam under three different conditions. The conditions differed in terms of the information that was given to the participants before they started working on the task. Problem solving group was told that the math assessment was a problem solving task. The math assessment group was told that their scores were going to be used to be study to study sex differences in mathematical ability. Well, that's weird, right? So we have three groups taking them the same math test, and I guess what they're doing differently is telling them what the goal of this is. So the first one says we're problem solving. The second one says um, we're looking at different gender or sorry sexes differences in mathematical abilities. And then the third one says is a teaching intervention group where you give the same information as a math assessment group. So you, I guess, make them aware of sex differences in mathematical ability. But they're also told what stereotype threat is and how it can impact performance. So this seems like the most interesting one. I, this intervention group right here is telling me that what they're really looking for is for people to dip in their performance whenever they're told that a certain sex is poor at math. And then whenever we instruct them what stereotype threat is, they're probably hoping that you kind of overcome that. So that'd be kind of a cool finding. This says figure one summarizes the results of this study. So remember for interpreting figures, we just read this, which is the average percent correct on the math assessment by group. And then we look at the axes. So average percent correct, and then the different groups. Okay, good deal. Not worrying about interpreting this, even though it's really, really quick. I'm not worried about interpreting it right now. Going on, it says anxiety has often been considered an explanation for stereotype threat. Okay, study two. This is important because people really, really get tripped up in the psych section because they allow everything to kind of melt together. And then you start melting basic sciences with studies that don't really correlate. And so we're moving on to study two. This is completely different from study one. They may be looking at something similar. This may be a spinoff study, but this is not part of study one. Study two is separate from study one. So study two was conducted to explore the role of anxiety on cognitive performance. So anxiety is a basic science. A group of participants was required to memorize lists of target words. During the training phase, before each target word was presented to them, the participants were asked to read a sentence out loud. Okay, so now they're just kind of explaining to us what study two is. So we've got these group of people. They're asked to memorize words, but before they're asked to memorize these words, they're asked to read a sentence out loud. Half of the people read something that is self-doubt, and I'm just going to do this. So half the people read something that's self-doubt, and then it says um, half the people read something that is self-confident. So like, you can do this. You can make a good score in your MCAT. You can do it like that. That's self-confidence. So they're going to read that stuff, and then they're, then they're going to try to memorize words. And if you go on to read it, it says that the, the participants memorized more words under the self-confidence condition. So yay, hype yourself up before you study for the MCAT. It'll help you study better, help you memorize more. Um, but the self-doubt, if you tell yourself that you'll never get into med school, you, they did poorly. As part of this design, they also measured electrical skin conductance and salivary cortisol levels. So... Cortisol is a basic science here. Um, I guess like conductance or electricity is technically a basic science, but we're not in the chem phys. They're not about to ask you to use like Ohm's law right here. Um, so I'm going to not highlight that as basic science. But cortisol, level, cortisol is the, it's colloquially known as like the stress hormone in the body. Um, they found that the participants in the self-doubt conditions had higher levels of skin conductance and cortisol than those in the self-confidence condition. So I'm gonna say self-doubt has hot, oh, that is not an arrow, has higher levels of cortisol, which is proportional to electrical skin conductance. I use a lot of abbreviations. So cortisol is the stress hormone. It's also kind of 
associated with like the sympathetic nervous systems and fight or flight stuff. So keep all that in mind whenever you are um, in this self-doubt condition, you're releasing a lot of cortisol, you've got a lot of this sympathetic nervous system going on, and that is probably causing some anxiety. That's kind of what they're saying that they're finding here. But let's take the questions. I did make a leap right here. This was not in the passage. Um, I just learned that in school, so I'm going to erase it then because that's not in the passage. Nobody cares what I know. Okay. Question 39 says, the training procedure used in study two primarily engages what? So think back to study two. That's whenever they gave us a list of words and they ask us to regurgitate those list of words after we chant our mantras that are either self-confident or self-doubting. So what type of memory allows you to memorize a list of words? That's what they're really going for. A says implicit memory. Implicit memory is kind of like the things that we memorize subconsciously. Um, so maybe not A. B is procedural memory, like tying your shoes. That's not memorizing lists. Um, C is sensory memory. That's like the really transient memory that allows us to like view after images and stuff like that. So maybe not to answer choice C um, because that's not memorizing a list of words. Sensory memory is less than one second. And then D is working memory. Now the answer you're probably looking for is short-term memory. And there is differences between working memory and short-term memory, namely that one of them is kind of like it under the umbrella of the other. But on the MCAT, functionally speaking, you're going to treat them the same. They're not going to ask you to split that difference. Okay, so if you're looking for short-term memory and, and you rule out the other three and all you find is working memory, that's the answer you're going with. So the correct answer to the number 39 is D because memorizing a list of words and having to spit them up in, another, in a minute or so, that is a form or fashion of short-term or working memory. Number 40 says, given the skin conductivity results from study two, participants in the self-doubt condition are likely to, to display all the following characteristics except for what? Okay, so remember, we just made this web that I erased for some reason about um, those in the self-doubt condition. So if you're in the self-doubt condition, then you've got a lot of cortisol, you know, you, you're very electric, and what the question is going to say, what can cortisol, high electrical skin conductivity, and things like that explain? Or rather, which of these is not explained by those? So A says increased sympathetic nerve, nervous system activity. Remember, cortisol is a stress hormone. In response to stress, we want to do things like mobilizing fatty acids, um, cranking out a lot more energy. It's the, it's the fight or flight. It's sympathetic nervous system. So a is not the correct answer, right? Because that is happening. B says increased nerve or blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. Remember, if we are activating the sympathetic nervous system, we are trying to create more blood sugars. Um, and so we're not going to be storing sugars. That would be more of the rest and digest phase. We're fight or flight. So we need all that energy. So we're probably going to be breaking down fats and proteins and things like that through gluconeogenesis to get to those blood sugars. So maybe not B. C says increased dilation of the pupils. Okay, when you get to this one, you're kind of like, oh, that's out of left field. What does that mean? I just want you to ask yourself, is this fight or flight? Or is this rest and digest? Increased dilation. Remember, if you were in a fight or you think that somebody's trying to kill you in a jungle, then you probably want your eyes to get bigger so you can see more at you, let more light in. And so dilation of the pupils is actually a sympathetic nervous system response. So the correct answer is not C. And then D says increased peristalsis along the digestive tract. That's kind of like the um, motor sequences that move food along the digestive system. So that is definitely rest and digest, right? And so we're looking for which of these answer choices is rest and digest, and that would be answer choice D. 41 says the effect of stereotype threat is obvious, or er, is observed in the performance of what? So I'm rephrasing this as which of these groups showed to have some form of fashion of negative performance due to worrying about a stereotype. So to figure that out, I'm going to have to go and see the metrics where the groups perform to see which one performed better, or which one performed worse, which is figure one. So now we're interpreting figure one. These error bars, remember, if the error bars overlap like they do here, then you can effectively look at those as being the exact same height. And so... All of these are overlapping. So that means this, 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 and this are effectively all the same height because the error bars are 
overlapping, and that means that they're within a standard deviation of each other. That means this could be due to variance. And so you can't make any hard scientific assumptions based off of something that's not outside the realm of variance. So that means that the only group that was affected is this column right here, which looks to have been women in the math assessment group. I really couldn't believe that this passage was on the MCAT the first time I took it. So now we're looking for something that says the women in the math assessment group. That's answer choice C. So I'm going to pick it. Going through the others, none of the other columns were different. They were all the same. So this one was the same, this one was the same, and this one was the same. So maybe not 41. Even though you can see that the columns are slightly different heights, remember, if they're within the error bars, then they're basically is no difference. You can assume that those columns are the exact same height. 42 says, which prediction is best supported by the findings in the passage? Ooh, this one's just pretty much saying, which of these is true? A says, anxiety is an unlikely explanation for the effect of stereotype threat. Why? Where's your support for that? Maybe not A. B says, given the results from study two, stereotype threat is caused by the arousal of the sympathetic nervous system due to self-doubt. I don't know that study two focused on self-doubt at all. It also didn't really focus on stereotype threat. Study one focused on stereotype threat. So notice they were mixing studies and that's why I warned you earlier, you've got to be able to separate in your mind study one from study two and figure out the goals behind each and the basic sciences behind each. Because if you don't, then you can kind of blend them and melt them together. And then you look at B and you're like, oh, that sounds pretty good. I kind of like it. But B is not the correct answer. Right, because study two was refer was looking at anxiety um, and, and self-doubt, self-confidence, and how that impacted your memory, whereas study one was the one that was looking at stereotype threats. So maybe not B. C says, given the results from the teaching intervention group, stereotype threat is not likely to be due to self-fulfilling prophecies. So we have the fact that the teaching intervention groups are the exact same height. But we also know that in the math assessment group, we still do get that difference between the women that are thinking, I, I guess it's a stereotype that women are bad at math, um, even though Maggie is an animal in math. However, you cannot tell me that it's impossible for this result to not be due to a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's possible that it is due to a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. So that means as C is not correct. D says the effect of stereotype threat may be eliminated if individuals are made aware of it. Well, that's the only variable that changed between these two groups. And it ended up turning out that the difference was completely eliminated. So I think it's very possible. I also like that they were softer with their language here. And they said it may be eliminated because that leaves some wiggle room. Remember, Germex only kills 99.9% .9 of germs. So we love wiggle room in the medical field. So... I like answer choice D. It is correct. Um, and this idea of wiggle room is also a good reason why you should rule out B because it's saying that this is causal. I don't like picking anything that is causal or impossible or possible. Or, no, I like possible. I don't like those hard words that don't allow for wiggle room. Okay, Keep that in mind as you're going through the exam, especially if you don't know what the heck the answer is. Pick something that allows for wiggle room. And number 43 says, which conclusion is not supported by figure one? We've already kind of looked at figure one, so I'm going to go ahead and read the answer choices before we scroll back to it. A says, participants' performance in the problem-solving and teaching intervention conditions was comparable. Well, remember, we talked about how those were exactly the same. So we're looking for one of the ones false. What's false about figure one? That is not false. B says women in the teaching intervention condition outperformed the women in the math assessment condition. Remember, these this was the only group that actually performed worse. So that is a true statement as well, so we can cross it out. C says women performed slightly worse than men only in the math assessment condition. That's correct. This uh, right here, this math assessment condition was the only one that dropped, whereas the women and the men performed exactly the same with invariance in the other two groups. So I can rule out C. Then D says teaching intervention instructions improved both men's and women's performance. No, that didn't happen, right? Because this and this are essentially the same number. What we would have to see for that to be true, I'm going to do purple because sure, is if we looked and we saw something like this. If we saw something like this, we can see that these error bars are above the top error bars in any of the other groups. And so there's no overlap. This is not due to 
pure variance, this is actually statistically significant. But we don't see that. We see that their error bars overlap just like the ones in adjacent groups. So um, that is a false statement. The correct answer is D. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.